Good afternoon. This is Eileen Doherty, and I'm going to wait one more mo minute. There were quite a few people signed up, and about half have um, <clears throat> have signed in at the moment. So I will wait another few um, seconds before we go ahead and get started. Hey, it looks like individuals have who wanted to join have joined. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> so I am Eileen Doherty and I am the director of the Colorado Gerontological Society. And I would like to welcome you to our presentation today for National Healthcare Decisions Day. This is a day that has been dedicated by the federal government to encourage people to think about end of life, uh, about what kinds of care that they would like to receive in their later years, who they would like to have involved, et cetera. In years prior, we have often participated in this program, but we have primarily looked at what types of tools do you need um, to have someone make decisions for you. So we focused on helping people to identify whether you need a medical power of attorney, financial powers of attorney, guardianship, et cetera. Today, we're gonna take a little bit different look at this and we're gonna look at uh, a patient priority decisions and some tools that maybe you can help in working with your care team as you think about those kinds of decisions in your life. This patient priority care model is really a de um, developed, if you will, for the medical community. And what I have done is I have looked at it from a patient perspective with the intent to say, if your doctor is really looking at how to provide patient-centered care, then how would you approach this type of um, service delivery? <clears throat> so patient priority care is really an approach. Its goal, if you will, is to align clinicians. Usually these are physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, um, to work with you in terms of what matters to you the most as the patient. One of the things that gets very complicated in this is that many older adults have multiple chronic conditions. And what we also know in terms of chronic conditions is that sometimes we have very good evidence-based medicine that can help us in terms of determining the trajectory of the um, disease and the outcome. And sometimes we don't necessarily have access to very good evidence-based medicine, especially if we're looking at multiple um, chronic diseases that we need to treat all at the same time. So if we look at a patient priority care model, one of the things that we're looking at is really trying to improve communication among all of the care partners. So whether those are patients, clinicians, um, whether it is outside agencies, such as home care agencies, hospices, anyone who is really involved in the development of the care plan, as well as actually providing care. One of the other things that this does is it helps us to find a systematic way in which we can uh, provide care for a very complex set of conditions, but we can also then um, focus on providing care that is wanted, 
by the individual and not providing care that the individual does not want. This leads as well to increased patient satisfaction because we have a more patient-centered approach to the delivery of care. Patient um, care of this type, really the goal is to align the care that these clinicians, whomever they are, are going to be providing and make sure, making sure that the patient or you as the individual, um, that not only is the care coordinated, but that we know what we want to achieve from the care. And we also then have a plan of how the experts are going to be involved in the delivery of care. Our focus really is to align everyone on um, the same care plan, on the same care model, and to have the uh, patient or you as the individual right at the center of not only directing that care, but oftentimes providing some of your own care. Decision-making with multiple chronic conditions is very complex. What happens when we come into our later years many times is that we do have multiple chronic conditions. We might have diabetes, we might have had a stroke, we might have had a hip replacement, um, we might have had um, kidney issues, liver issues, could be any number of things that um, we have to focus on. And the biggest thing that we face from a medical perspective is that frequently um, no two people present with the same type of health and life conditions. Therefore, that reduces our evidence-based medicine and delivery system with that combination of conditions. Additionally, each one of us is an individual, so we bring very individualized um, life experiences to um, our healthcare setting. Um, <clears throat> we also know that many times the interventions that are suggested are sometimes actually very uncertain, or we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. While medicine is often seen as a science, it is not always as accurate of a science as we might like, because we don't know, again, how individuals will react to certain interventions or to certain treatments. Healthcare can also become very burdensome, especially for patients, but it can also be burdensome for the clinicians who are involved as well. Um, things like going frequently for blood tests, going frequently for um, injections, going back for just plain follow-up care can oftentimes be very uh, burdensome for the individual. Can also sometimes be burdensome for, for clinicians, especially if we are getting care in the home. As we have come out of COVID, we are finding it more and more difficult to find caregivers that will go into the home. Some things have been improved, such as some of the telehealth work that has evolved over time. <clears throat> disease, disease by disease decisions can also become very cumbersome and full of conflict. And sometimes we actually see that as we are treating one disease or one problem, then the outcome of that can be very harmful to another disease or um, diagnoses that we have. So for example, a number of years ago, I had a gentleman that I was worked with very closely and he had a number of heart issues, but by the time they got done treating the heart issues, he was also being treated for gag reflex and pretty soon he was also then had a very negative reaction to the some of the medications and now had some joint problems. So it was like one thing right after the other. The other thing is that there's often no right answer, even though that is what we are looking for. So again, we need as the individual who is come who is facing these kinds of decisions need to come to focus 
on the fact that we may not be able to ever find the right decision. So when we're looking at patient priority care planning, what, there are two things that we want to really look at. The first one is we want to identify our own health priorities. What is it that we want? What is it that we're willing to do? And how are we willing to engage with that? The second then is once we have identified those priorities, we need to find a healthcare team and we need to identify that care with those health priorities. So there are some principles of patient priority care. The first one in terms of the health priorities are, what are you as the patient or the individual, what are your health outcome goals? What do you want? What do you want to achieve in terms of activities? And what are you willing and able to do? Being willing to do something is also different than being willing to have it happen to you. So, for example, I recently had a young woman who was terrified of needles and would not even accept a blood test. So in that situation, while she might benefit, if her priority is not to have blood tests, then her healthcare preferences may be very limited. The second priority is patient outcomes. What is it that you want from your healthcare? Do you want to feel better? Do you want to be able to walk better? Do you want to be able to do more traveling? Um, do you wanna be able to breathe easier? What's your outcome that you want? The more specific that you can be and measurable and actionable, the more likely that these outcome goals are going to be able to at least inform the decision that you go forward with. So for example, I have a gentleman who refuses to wear a CPAP machine. As he experiences more and more difficulty breathing at night, I am not sure that although he would like to be less tired during the day, if he's not able to tolerate a CPAP machine, then that's going to change very specifically what decisions we can make in terms of helping him to be less tired during the day. The healthcare activities that we are willing and able, again, to engage in. So if we have people who um, are not willing to take certain medications, they're hesitant to take medications. Um, some medications sometimes are well tested, FDA approved. Sometimes we are presented with medications that um, are in clinical trials um, that are being tested. Um, sometimes there's risks associated with those medications. Um, sometimes the medications that we take, um, the uh, side effects are worse than the actual condition that we're trying, trying to, to treat. So again, we need to figure out what um, medications we're willing to take and what the side effects are that we're willing to uh, manage. Another thing we want to look at is self-management tasks. This really gets oftentimes into things like therapies. Are we willing to engage in exercise every day, getting up out of our chair? And again, I don't mean that maybe necessarily a strenuous exercise program, but are we willing to get up and walk three or four times a day from our chair to the kitchen? Um, are we able to um, <clears throat> and or willing to go for a walk outside? Um, <clears throat> How many times and what kind of visits are we willing to do to our healthcare providers? I now have a lady who has um, deteriorated so bad with her uh, spinal stenosis, with her deteriorated hips, as well as with her heart conditions that she is now telling her healthcare providers that she is no longer able to come to their office 
um, out at the university. And if they need to have certain kinds of tests or procedures, she's basically saying, you need to come to my house and perform those. So again, that is helping, if you will, in the decision-making for her care, because she is going to be less aggressively treated. Um, most likely, if she's treated in the home, than she is with if we were going into the office and doing additional tests that could help us make different decisions. So one of the other things that's really, really, really important in patient priority care is what they refer to as the one thing. The one thing is what is your priority that you wanna do based on your values, your outcome goals, and the care that you think is helpful, the care that you think is burdensome, and what is it that is the one thing that you wanna focus on? Is that one thing family interaction? Is that one thing going on one more um, trip? Is that one thing finishing um, a book that you started to write? Is that one thing becoming more involved in your um, church or your community? Whatever that one thing is, that is what we want to really focus on in terms of patient priority care. That is your goal and you need to own that. We talk a lot about that over the next few slides. When we're looking at patient priority care, we also need to look at the health trajectory. So um, what is it that um, is an expected um, changes, if you will, in your health and how is that going to affect your functioning? So if you have cancer, for example, and you it is no longer treatable, how is that going to affect your pain tolerance? How is that going to affect your ability to engage in the community? How is it going to um, it affect you in terms of your ability to manage your bodily functions? Um, so what does it look like? Um, and again, we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily predict everything. What we can do is at least look at how it might affect us and then make decisions. So again, priority number six goes all the way back again to that one thing. This is your decision-making focused on what you want in the many conditions that you are facing the decisions that you have to make, what are the trade-offs, and what are your treatment options. You have to decide based on the information you have on how you want to be, um, what treatments you want to have. If any, you may decide that you don't want any treatments and you simply want to enjoy life as it currently is. So just to review, the patient priority plan then looks really at what matters most. What are your values? What do you want to have happen during the trajectory of this disease? What in that, um, within that disease, what is your most important health goal? Is it to be pain-free? Is it to um, have fewer, or is to take all aggressive treatment and to see if you um, are able to put the disease in remission? Um, is it to um, treat the symptoms and let the project progression of the disease go forward? You need to identify what bothers, what symptom bothers you the most or what problem is interfering with your goal. So if your goal is to be pain-free, then, and you are having pain breakthrough, um, but you don't like how the pain pills make you feel because you feel out of control 
or you're feeling like you're not able to make decisions, then that is something that is interfering as a symptom and as a problem. And you may need to review um, whether you want that much pain medication. Many of us also have very specific thoughts about our healthcare preferences. So this um, includes a whole lot of things. Uh, it can include where we want the care to be delivered. Is it in the home setting? Is it in a care facility such as an assisted living or a nursing home? Do we want to live with our family? Do we want our family to live with us? Additionally, preferences can also include who is going to be delivering that care. Um, are, is it going to be a nurse practitioner? Is it going to be a physician? Is it going to be a highly trained specialist, um, a cardiologist, an oncologist, um, an orthopod? So again, what is it, you know, who is going to be delivering that care? Um, and then another part of this preference is who is going to be involved? So are family going to be the only people who provide care with the support of the healthcare professionals? Is it going to be a home care team? Is it going to be a hospice team? Is it going to be one with family, friends, and neighbors? What does that look like? We also need to evaluate, if you will, the medications. Most of the time when we are faced with um, a healthcare decision such as this, medications is one of the options. What do we, um, as we test them, and again, medications are, uh, don't always work. So which ones work, which ones are burdensome, which ones causes problems? Which ones do we not like the side effects on? Um, what ones make us feel better? Um, <clears throat> and then are there additional medications that we have to take in conjunction with the medications for the major um, disease? So for example, Parkinson's patients often are taking cinnamon. Cinnamon has terrible side effects for some people causing them to have hallucinations and lots of paranoia. And so if you're taking those medications, then um, <clears throat> you probably will be prescribed some um, psychotic, uh, psychiatric drugs as well. And if you don't like the psychiatric drugs, then, uh, and what happens there, that that may become too big of a burden. I have one lady right now who has a horrible tremor that is the result of the Haldol. The Haldol though helps her to keep the um, paranoia and the other side effects of the schizophrenia under control. So she's chosen to put up with it, but it's a very burdensome tremor. And oftentimes she's not able to feed herself at this point in time. So this brings us to kind of the last thing again, and that is what is this one thing in this disease or series of diseases that we want to happen and is um, our priority. So developing a patient priority care plan then, this helps us, if you will, to look specifically at how we work with the clinicians. So once we have identified the one thing, then we need to focus on what activity that we want to do um, rather than probably eliminating the symptoms, um, especially if eliminating those symptoms is not possible. Um, we then need to figure out in terms of these healthy interventions, we need to talk to the clinicians and ask them to help us sort out, if you will, what medications are possible, what diagnostic procedures we should undergo, what treatments we might uh, be um, looking at as we um, either search out this dis dis diagnosis or as we proceed to treat it, what surgeries might be available, 
what specialty care might be available. So these are all things that we need to talk about and think about, but we need to have the clinicians focus very much on, as they're talking to us, what we want rather than always referring back to, well, the literature shows us or the disease-based research focuses on this. What we really want to get um, a feel for in at this step is how is this going to help me do the one thing I want to do and accomplish that activity. At each visit that you see your clinician, you should always have them review your health prior priorities and you should work with them to assess any changes. You should be honest with them so that your clinician, again, can make whatever adjustments you and um, that person feel are necessary, if any are in fact necessary. You want to talk about the disease that is uh, the disease itself and the care that is going on so that if there are any changes required, again, that those can happen at the time of the visit. Say, stay laser focused on your one thing and make sure that as the clinician is changing things, identifying or assessing new um, symptoms, that you stay focused on what your priority is so that you are able to um, manage that. You may need, to, you may find that you need to make changes as your disease uh, progresses and your well being and your emotional um, self may also change as you go through this. Again, recognizing that as anyone goes through change, and copes with these kinds of disease processes that we in fact know that change may be required. Make sure that as you and your uh, clinician are talking that you reach conclusions jointly. And each time check your patient chart or have someone check it, sign up for the electronic medical records so that you can read what in fact the clinician has put in your chart. And if that is not accurate, that you um, talk with the clinician the on the next visit to um, either clarify or to change that. Um, and then at the end of each visit, you want to review with the clinician what the next steps are whether we're gonna continue on the same path that we have been on, whether we're going to increase um, or change a medication, whether we are going to do some additional diagnostic work, whether we're gonna follow up with blood tests or more x-rays, whatever the plan is, make sure that you both understand what you're planning to do. If your healthcare goals are not achievable or not realistic, um, then your next task to work out with your clinician is what are the alternatives? You may have some ideas about what you want to change. Again, you may want to modify the one thing that you want to do. Um, and as you change it, again, you will want to, again, go through the same interventions because now you may have a different goal. You may now have a different health outcome. Um, I have frequently seen people as they go through the prog progression of a disease where initially they want to be um, as active as they can be. They'll be engaged in their community the disease um, progresses, they find themselves having to be more homebound, they're looking for more social interaction um, as they um, are more homebound. So again, these can become very important as you talk to your clinician and as the disease gets even more um, progressive, you may find that you need to change again and all you really want is to be either pain-free or left alone or be in as quiet of, of an environment as possible. 
there is nothing wrong with changing um, what your healthcare goals are and changing your one thing that you want to do. The key is to make sure that it is um, achievable and to make sure that in your current situation, it's realistic. I know of a gentleman who used to be on the CGS board who had a type of brain cancer many years ago, and his very last activity that he wanted to do was to um, climb some trail up to Pikes Peak, and he managed to do that, but within about three weeks, he was on hospice, and it didn't take very long, and he passed away, but he was very laser-focused on that one thing and stayed um, stayed the course until he was able to achieve it. And then um, kind of was able to give up and say, okay, I've achieved that. Now my next goal is to basically spend time with my family and to have a peaceful uh, passing. <clears throat> As you're looking at um, the one thing and finding these interventions, understand that many times this is going to be trial and error. Um, you may try something for a week, two weeks, a month, and you may not get the outcome that you're looking for. It's okay. It doesn't mean you have to stay with that. You can always change a course. You can look at different options and you can um, either implement those yourself independently, or you can um, talk those over with your clinician and your care provider or your family and significant others and make a new plan. One of the other things that sometimes enters into this trial and error is that you may, the clinician or the other um, providers may suggest something as the best option, but it's not the one you want. The one that comes to mind most frequently is people who um, have memory impairment and <clears throat> they want to stay in their own home, um, but that um, <clears throat> is not the best option for them. The best option for them may be that they need to go to um, either a nursing home or a memory care assisted living. Um, and so one of the things that I have learned over time is that don't allow people and don't allow yourself to set your expectations that say, I'm never going to do that because I cannot guarantee and nor can anybody else that will be able to do that, <clears throat> to do the best option, even if it's one, we may have to choose the best option, even if it's one that you do not want. Give you an example of that. Um, about 10 years ago, I had a lady who was adamant that she did not want to go to a nursing home. She had a very bad stroke. Um, she had no family. And she was unable to feed herself. She was unable to turn herself. Um, and although I knew in my heart of hearts that she wanted to stay in her own home, she didn't have enough money that I could hire 24-hour care. And so I had, and because she was relatively low income, I had to put her on Medicaid and put her in a nursing home. It's not what she wanted but it was the best option that I could give her. Um, interventions, um, they you need to guide those over time. You need to take charge of your interventions and make sure that they are meeting your goals. Gone are the days, hopefully, when most of us just accept what the clinician suggests as the only alternative to our care. There have been lot, there's been lots of work done over the last 40 to 50 years in which we have done a lot in terms of patient advocacy to help um, <clears throat> people who are seeking medical care to advocate and to be a part of that care delivery rather than 
for the clinician to basically make a suggestion and you blindly accept that or to start that intervention without really understanding what the implications are, what the patient education is. Um, <clears throat> and again, if these interventions or these um, patient education materials do not meet your goals, it's certainly okay to say you are not going to participate in them. Sometimes clinicians will accept, it will suggest interventions and there usually are protocols around them. And you may, be de may decide that as part of those protocols, they're absolutely too risky for anything that you want to be involved with. And again, it's okay to say that. You need to guide that and you need to be an active partner in that decision making. The best way to align your priorities to your care is to really have this discussion that your care, if it's not consistent with your physician's plan, then you need to let that physician or that clinician know that. You need to tell the physician what interventions you want and you it is no longer okay to just blindly accept what the physician wants. One of the things that happens as we are looking at end of life situations is that my value system needs to be put away. I, as the person who is the power of attorney, who is the clinician who is providing care, who is the family friend, doesn't really matter what my role is. What I have to do is I have to say, what is it that individual wants? And I have to do everything in my power to help them get the intervention and the care that they want. If there are significant differences in what can be accomplished with what I want and what the physician wants, then I need to look at how do I reconcile those differences? And I may not be able to reconcile them. But I will always err when I am working with people on the side of the choice of what is that one thing goal the individual wants and how do I make sure that I do everything in my power to make sure that they get that. Um, the other thing that's really, really important in all of this in terms of aligning your priorities is also aligning them with what your family and significant others want. So for example, if you um, really want to have no basic interventions and you have been diagnosed with cancer, um, it's important that your family knows that you are not going to be taking any type of um, interventions around checking on the progress of the disease, uh, doing the blood testing, doing uh, <clears throat> any of the injections, um, and that you are going to simply allow the disease to go forward. And if you want to be, um, if you want hospice, then your family needs to know that. If you don't want hospice, then your family needs to know that. If you do not want um, to have your heart revived, should it quit, you need to know, your family needs to know that. So all of those kinds of decisions really need to be shared as well with the care team and get those aligned, but they also need to be shared with family. Another thing that happens as we go through kind of this patient priority um, tool is this issue of non-compliance. And non-compliance by patients is one of the biggest challenges that the clinical world faces. It's okay to be non-compliant. What you need to understand is that if you decide that you are not going to follow the suggested treatment, that you understand what the implications of that are and why you don't want to do it. So say, for example, you are supposed to be taking 
um, a medication that helps you breathe easier and you decide that that's something you are no longer going to do, that is perfectly in your right to do that. But understand <clears throat> that if you make that decision, that then will impact other um, symptoms that you may experience um, and it will impact how your care team um, engages with you. Sometimes we decide that we are not going to um, take the medications or we're not going to do the treatment because we don't want to deal with the burden or the uncomfortable treatment. So I recently had a lady who was diagnosed with metastatic um, ovarian cancer. And while I think I could get her through the actual surgery itself, and I think because it was going to be a pretty invasive surgery, the next challenge or the next decision that we had to make, and she has limited decision-making capability, is that I don't think I could get her through the next stages because she would have to leave her assisted living where her dear friend lives and many other acquaintances. She would have to go to a nursing home and be um, very alone and she wouldn't know anybody. She doesn't make friends very easily. Um, she would have to go into the clinic every two to three weeks for various kinds of infusion therapy. In the interim, she would have to have uh, various kinds of blood tests. Um, she would lose her hair. And so as we began to talk about all of those um, <clears throat> symptoms, if you will, and interventions that would be required, the burden of this care and her being uncomfortable in these situations, we chose to go on hospice simply to make um, her more comfortable and bringing her quality of life. So her one thing, even though she hasn't been able to articulate it very well, from my perspective, is to be able to continue to live in her own apartment with her friends in her assisted living. Um, and we are making the decision that we are opting out of many other treatment alternatives. We still could, if we want, in this lady's situation, we could change our goal. We could decide that we want to go back and do the um, surgery. But um, at this point, that's not a decision that we're probably going to do. If your physician or your care partners or clinicians um, disagree with you, make sure that they accept your decision um, and treat you accordingly. Sometimes we also find that our health goal or our one thing is not achievable. Um, so we also need to be very open and listen to um, our clinicians and our healthcare providers um, about what they see as the trajectory of our condition. They oftentimes have at least seen some situations that are similar to what we are presenting with and that we um, <clears throat> are what we want to do may not be possible. Um, so for example, if I have, again, I'll use my friend here with advanced cancer, metastatic cancer. If she were to say to me that I want to take a road trip um, to uh, Florida because I've never seen the Florida ocean, that probably is not going to be very um, doable because I don't think she could tolerate the car ride, even though that might be something that she wants. And so we might have to change again, what it is that we want. She might be able to tolerate an airplane ride, although I think that would be very difficult for her as well, given her mental frailty at this point. Ultimately, anything that you do, it's your decision and your physician needs to support that. 
So you need to be realistic as you are thinking about your one thing and what the benefit of these interventions are, what the consequences of your decisions are, make sure that your family understands your decision. And if there is a bad outcome as a result of your decision, basically you need to accept that decision and not blame others. You need to then bring your physician along with you, if you will, as you, um, <clears throat> as you make those decisions and go about achieving your um, patient-centered care in this patient priority model. Uh, <clears throat> so I hope that some of those ideas have been helpful to you as you have uh, begun to think about what is the most important thing that you will want in your health care, whether it's now or whether it's as your health deteriorates over time. So in closing, I'll just mention a couple things about the Gerontological Society. We spend a lot of time looking at social determinants of health. We have um, grant programs to provide help with vision, hearing, and dental services. We have a tele, excuse me, a telephone buddy program where we can match individuals um, with older adults who um, are lonely, isolated, or depressed, and who want to improve their self worth and their self esteem, their social connections with a volunteer for the community. We can do advanced care planning, both we have a series of educational programs that we're going to be offering over the next year, the balance of the year, as well as we can help with individual um, counseling and support in terms of advanced directives. There's also a pretty comprehensive toolkit on our website. Um, I understand a couple of those links are broken. So if you try to go there today, uh, probably your uh, experience is not going to be the greatest. We do a lot of Medicare and Medicaid counseling, especially during open enrollment, um, which is from October 15th through December 7th. Um, we do educational programs as well as ind individual work with older adults on enrollment, eligibility, um, getting you look hooked up with insurance agents, uh, Medicare Advantage plans, prescription drug plans, Medicare supplements, whatever kind of meets your needs. We have a housing and home care locator, which is a searchable database of all of the licensed home care and assisted livings in the state of Colorado. Um, and you can search it on price and location and services and amenities. And then we do a lot of benefits counseling as well. We're also fairly active in the education and advocacy space. Um, we do the Salute to Seniors, uh, which is a big senior expo. That will be August the 24th um, in person at the Greek Event Center and virtually on August the 25th. We do Medicare Monday educational programs. Some of those will be um, in person as well throughout the state, and some will be virtual. Um, we have some fact sheets and stuff to help people with multi-generational family housing and supports. Um, our senior resource guidebook is fairly popular. We have distributed about 10,000 copies around the state to local libraries. So if you are um, looking for a copy of that, um, you are welcome to check, at, check with your local library. Um, if you just want to go online, you can get most of the information from the Housing and Home Care Locator. Our website has a fair amount of information on it as well. We have a newsletter, which we distribute to about 32,000 households around Colorado. Um, you're welcome, again, if you would like to get on the mailing list for that. It's mailed three times a year. We have a pretty extensive YouTube library on aging in place, as well as advanced care planning. There's some other information out there as well, but those are the two primary areas of information. And we are extremely active, um, at least during this time of the year in the legislative world, um, down at the Capitol, as well as working with policymakers 
um, around a large number of um, issues facing older adults. And with that, I will close. Um, thank you all for attending today.